So it was weird because it was it was not all self-organized online. I mean, that was a big part of it, but there was also this guy named Jason Wosky who had become the state director, which is always interesting when you get there, um, when somebody already has your title. But um, <laughs> they, had, you know, and they were working with you know Elijah Cummings and and the Attorney General, and they had actually created county by county chapters of folks who kept in touch with each other through the MyBo tools, but you know met and they would meet as a as a uh, statewide steering committee of 150 people every Saturday. I mean, it was pretty amazing. So it was, it was before we got there, they were just good organizers, um, but all volunteers, obviously. Um, so, you know, it was probably the easiest job I've ever had is just being like, okay, it's already basically running. Let's get Barack in here a couple times, Michelle, and um, call it a day. But, but it, was, it, was the, it was, again, the merger of the two. But I think your question about sort of, um, what's your question about the future is? You want to answer that? No, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think, it, I think that is the question, right? It's the question of, of what happens to the Obama campaign going forward, et cetera. Um, I think that, you know, there's tons of ways that use the technology. You know, there's ways to do training online. Um, there's ways to bring people together, obviously, online. I think that, you know, without um, a large, you know, without having 2,500 organizers, uh, I don't know if that's actually the real number, but it's, uh, it's around there, <laughs> um, maybe even higher. Um, that's not on the record. Um, so without having that on the ground, um, I think that um, you can still use this technology, um, but I think it, it, with, with all of those sort of things that I think Marshall was talking about, uh, you know, about, you know, one of the things in leadership as we were building these teams that we learned quickly is that the person that raises their hand first to become the team leader is often the worst leader. Um, and so oftentimes online, the person that, that sets up the MIBO group first is often the worst leader um, but because they, were, they just have more time and are more active, but maybe not the person that really um, could bring people together to really motivate action. So one of the key questions is how do you develop leaders in that online community where, um, you know, is what kind of structure do you put in place to sort of um, – define who, that, who the leader is and what do you have to do to become a leader? Um, are there tests that you have to go through um, so that anybody just can't come on and say, you know, I'm going to be the leader of this organization in this community? I think that's sort of the biggest question. Um, because without the leadership, um, you have a problem of, uh, you know, whoever decides they want to step up, whether or not they're leading the organization in completely the wrong direction or um, taking it on a different mission or, or you doing it in a different name is, I think, the key question. Let me, let me just add to that. that the, those six items I went through about, you know, values and strategy and so forth are, are leadership practices. In other words, that's what leaders, that's the, what the practice of leadership entails with a volunteer group especially. So the question is, how do you accomplish that? Um, and it's particularly challenging because many of them are interpersonal skills. So it's not like mastering a body of data about uh, geology. Uh, uh, I'm involved in designing a, a distance learning version of my organizing class that I teach here for the spring. And we're going to experiment with that. It's challenging, frankly, because if people enroll as individuals and you're trying to teach people interactive skills, uh, so one rule we've made is people are going to enroll as teams. In other words, we'll only accept people who already come formed as teams. Uh, and then uh, that will allow us to coach interactive uh, practice and use video, we hope, in order to give feedback. I, we're going to try. Uh, but it's, I think, you, but you have to, this whole thing of self-organization, I think, is a chimera. I mean, I just think it's a wish. Uh, the reality is that it takes skill and craft and practice to be good at it. And the question is how to develop that capacity, not just sort of wish that it'll happen and then, oh, gee, it, it was a miracle. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and, but we can do much more than we have been able to do, I think, if we approach it focused on the right things. So but it, the, the last thing I'll say, I know there's other questions, is if you look at California in the primary, nine yeah. organizers, yeah. Uh, what Buffy, who was the field director out there, was able to create was, a, was an organization that was statewide um, and was able to produce way more calls per organizer, certainly, and really per capita than, than, than most states. Um, and they used, all the, they used the technology 
but had a very small um, you know, staff structure to make it happen. So I think places like that are case studies and, and how it could work. Well, and just, just one quick on, on Buffy in California. <laughs> what was not traditional uh, was a leadership team structure at the base. See, traditional is like you find somebody and put them in charge and then they burn out or they seize all the, they try to seize the power or, you know, it's that kind of deal. Uh, we launched through these Camp Obamas, we launched teams, leadership teams, interdependent teams that were designed purposely uh, with shared norms, with a structure and so forth. It gave them a durability, a longevity and a capacity that I hadn't seen before with volunteer efforts. And so Buffy, with very few organizers, was able I mean, in two weekends, we launched 200 of these teams. Now, of course, some flaked out and you know, so forth. The coaching is a critical role here. And that's another little thing to mention is about the significance of coaching. But I, I just wanted to emphasize, just because it involves people face to face doesn't mean it's traditional. Uh, it just means that uh, it's people face to face. And there's lots of innovation to be done there as well as in the other approaches. Yeah. I mean, I think the video we used to get people to do stuff was, okay, here's the story of what we did and like sign up right here to do it, which was very effective and we saw huge you know, sign up rates. Um, what I think you're also asking, or at least what I'm thinking is, did we experiment with people actually creating their own video um, and telling you know, their story to the campaign, which I think nationally they may have done some, but I don't, I don't think we did it any in our states. Um, and in terms of going forward, um, I mean, I, I, I think there's probably tons of lessons that you guys probably know way better than I do um, about video and moving people into action that I don't, I don't even claim to, to know the answers to, other than, you know, a good video connected to a, a real narrative about what's happening that's real um, and a way to capture people when they say they want to do something from that and get them into action. Um, you know, if you have all of those things, I mean, I think it's going to be powerful no matter what year you're working on it. One of the real challenges uh, is the communication, of, uh, is emotional communication, okay, uh, over, over the internet, uh, is, is uh, the communication of affect. Uh, as you know, it's very easy to express emotion, right? But it's a lot harder to experience, uh, experience it. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's too easy to express emotion because we're not empathetically inhibited uh, from the person being right in front of us. How many people have had that experience? And so you just send off an email in anger and they go, oh, geez, why did I do that? I should have pushed delete. It's because uh, we're used to uh, emp empathy both as communication and inhibition. It, we understand then the social context that we're in. And the, the ability of the video to communicate um, uh, empathy, uh, for empathetic communication, uh, I think is really important. Uh, and one of the reasons why it had such an impact. Uh, so we have to appreciate the significance of emotional as well as conceptual communication. I'll take the easy one. With Susan All right. Um, it, no, it's a great question. Um, I think, I actually think it might have been, what Joe's referring to is, is uh, I have a book coming out in February uh, called Why David Sometimes Wins. And, but uh, it's about the farm work organization, but then also at the end, the way in which it implodes. Uh, and uh, the implosion, I locate a lot to lack of accountability systems. And, and I think there's a, I think with the, this mode of communication, there's an even greater danger in that. It's very easy to sit in a room and imagine you're connected to a million people out there uh, and just do your thing. Uh, whereas if you have to interact with other people, um, again, it's this power of, of, of empathetic interaction. Um, it creates more accountability in it. I think accountability was a huge problem there. I think it's a problem of leadership isolation through lack of accountability mechanisms within the organization. Uh, I don't know that this, this might even have made it worse. Uh, in fact, there was a period when um, there was an effort to try to market the boycott as opposed to organize the boycott. Because we did these great boycotts and they were organized city by city and there was an effort to try to do it through direct mail and. Um, it fell flat because it was a marketing operation when what took the boycott to work was organization, but that then means people and structure and accountability. And so that, that's my thought on that. And then on, on your leadership question, um, usually we would fire them. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. So when I was in Pennsylvania, we messed up because we only had, we thought we only had eight weeks. So we had these trainings. There were 1,800 people that showed up this Saturday. We trained them, and we leaders were just as appointed, right? Um, and tons of them were fantastic, and they were great, and they are were the leaders all the way through the general election, and you know, are running for office themselves now, or doing some. You know, they're going to be leaders in this organization going forward. Um, others were really bad, um, and we had spent a lot of time, way too much time of our organizers' time, figuring out how to replace that person. You know, having those difficult conversations, and then telling them that you know it, this is actually a leadership role in the campaign, and um, we're not hitting where we need to be, and so we're bringing somebody else in, and that happens at the staff level as well. Um, so the importance of that process being right, I think, uh, because no one wants to fire anybody, particularly a volunteer. Um, but you, you have to do it in order to get the organization where it needs to be. Well, and what was cool, the impression is that, that there was much more transparency because of the internet tools. Yes. Was, you could see who, who was, what was happening and what wasn't happening. And so it introduced <clears throat> a kind of transparency that's so difficult in most organizations with tiers to actually know what's happening and to be able to, to see what's happening and evaluate in that way. And everybody knows it's all in front of God and everybody. It's a very, uh, I, I thought that was a really important thing. So, so there's a change.gov question, but then there's a sort of campaign question yeah, as well. Sure. So, what's happening? So, so there's th there's millions of people right on our email list, and there's mil millions of volunteers out there. So, what we've been doing is going through a process to figure out to to be what we're calling deliberate haste, which is what Barack talks about with, with with his um, you know transition into um, you know till January 20th, which is to figure out um, what worked and what didn't work, and what what do people in the community really um, care about. So, the first step we did is we sent a survey out. Um, that new media folks send out um, that has over 500,000 responses. Um, and not just, um, you know, uh, one to four, but like open-ended questions as well about where they want to see the movement going. But, but also, like, what do we do well and not do well? Because if we're going to go forward, we've got to figure out um, what was it that people at the very grass, at the local level really thought about the organization. You know, they might not tell you face to face, but um, you know, they're giving us this great feedback on on all that sort of stuff. So that was one thing that we did. Um, second thing is last weekend we held a conference um, of some of the best um, neighborhood team leaders and some of the best organizers um, and got their feedback as well in small group discussions about what they thought about what worked, what didn't work, and, and what we're, we should do going forward. Um, we've held thousands of conference calls with field organizers. And we'd get tens of them on a call, uh, get their feedback, get their ideas on the vision going forward. We did the same thing with regional field directors. We did individual calls with people at higher level on the campaign. Um, and then this weekend, um, there's house parties going on across the country. Um, as you know, David Pluff has been emailing out about. And the, the key of those is to really get people's feedback on what worked and what didn't and their visions for going forward. So um, it's telling us a lot about what our community wants um, and what they're willing to do. I mean, we asked like how many hours are they willing to put, all this sort of stuff. So all of that is happening. Now, what happens to the change.gov thing is, is sort of, you know, figuring out and how to, you know, a lot of those people, you know, are going to get jobs and some won't. And what do you do with all that energy? And, and people over there want to do things around, you know, that, that, so I think that's a question we just have to figure out. Well, I guess I just was interested because, I mean, it sounds like you're doing a really interesting thing at almost like a customer satisfaction survey with the yeah. volunteers. Um, but one of the important things that, that Marshall pointed out was the need for like discernible, you know, action, right? Like a thing that you're going to do. And you're sort of asking 500,000 people what you're going to do, which is a very different question than like you're asking you to help get Barack Obama elected. Right. Right. I mean, we will after, so now it's sort of the process of like redefining the next step and redefining what the organization looks like and who's in charge of it and where is it housed and all that sort of stuff. As those questions are answered, there will definitely be that sort of like, here's what we're asking you to do. I mean, the ask right now is that hold this house party, be a part of this process. Like, you, your voice should be heard in this. Um, as, we, as, we, as we listen to your voice, we'll come up with the next steps. And then there will be asks around that. I mean, we don't just ask people to go to the house meetings either, the house parties. We're asking them also to... Um, come up with a civic engagement pro project uh, or service project in their community around the holidays, um, you know, that, that, that sort of is something that they're going to be doing, um, and then we will, as we move the organization forward, come up with that. Uh, I, I didn't fully appreciate the concept of deliberate haste. Uh, I have a better appreciation of that now. Uh, I, think, uh, I think I was impatient, uh, and I think that the process of, uh, of learning that's going on is a very important one. I think that uh, sometimes I've, I've observed the campaign to um, close itself off from outside 
uh, contributions uh, in ways that might be more helpful not to do. But it's at the margins. It's at the margins. Uh, Can you speak up? I said it's at the margins. Uh, I just said it's, um, what is it, friendly criticism? That's the intent. Um, so I don't, I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. And I mean, I think we, we could do a better job of, of telling the story of what we're doing. You know, I mean, most people don't know the process we're going through. And we're getting it out there, and there's going to be more. And, you know, uh, the emails that are starting to go out about, you know, you know, people are wondering, is it over? Like, the office is gone. Um, my organizer is gone. What does that mean about what do I do? And, and so there's a lot of people out there on, if you, if you, know, if you read the, the MIBO groups and things like that, people are wanting to know, and they want to be a part of it. Um, and we're doing a better job, I think, now of, of making sure they know what process we're going through. Um, Archon. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, I mean, that's a good, it is a very product, product, provocative question. I don't think there's anything anar anarchistic about saying this organization is going to the next step. We want the feedback of the people that have made this organization what it is. It doesn't mean that we're going to, that all, like, a thousand different groups are going to come up with their own projects, and that's going to be the organization. It's saying, here are some of the things that we, that, that, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear exactly how you were organized, what criticism you have of the way you were organized, what things you thought were great about the way you were organized, so that as we set up the organization going forward, we can make tweaks. You know, were the teams too big? Were they too small? Was the or did we have too many organizers? And then, and then the question is, what do you want to see? What's your vision of this to go next? Um, and you know, we're seeing tons of very interesting information about a lot of people within the organization have very clear priorities about what they want to do. Number one, push Barack Obama's legislative agenda, knowing that our organization is very clearly with that, and then also that they're willing to give hours, that they're willing to put in time. Is, is key for us to know how to set up the organization so we don't just sit in a room and say, well, you know, we think the volunteers out there are willing to give 20 hours a week um, like they did in the campaign, and we think this is the number one priority that everyone cares about. Let's make it and let's go. I mean, it's a process of, of actually figuring out, taking the temperature of the organization. What I'm saying is, my understanding is in the campaign, you didn't really ask people for a lot of ideas and come up with, use that for a collective strategy to create something going forward. You asked them to do a lot of stuff, and that stuff was pretty clear. Not true. Yeah, after the, after the Pennsylvania primary, I came to Chicago with a group of people. We did the exact same process. Uh, survey out to all of our volunteers, commerce calls of all of our organizers, a, a deliberate process of, you know, what did we do and how should we set this up for the general election? Brought everyone together, did a training with a program that came from those conversations, those surveys, those discussions that we were having amongst people uh, within the organization and without about how we ran uh, the primary. So it's actually, in very many, many ways, the, a very similar process. But yeah, as we get to the next stage of like making the decisions about where we're going forward, it's not going to be like, hey, we want everybody's ideas on what we do next on everything. There's going to be a, there's going to be a, a, a plan. There's going to be a process. There's going to be an organization set up. So, uh, let me just add to that that. The, the strategy, the organizing strategy that emerged in the campaign was not like conceived whole cloth at the beginning. Uh, <coughs> there was a whole lot of uh, learning uh, and a lot of mistakes uh, and learning from those mistakes and looking at successes. I mean, I think one of the strengths of the campaign was its capacity to learn. Uh, and so I think the question here is to how, in this next phase, how much learning? is the organization prepared to do? Because uh, certainly, uh, like what you work on, there's a lot to contribute about that. Uh, and I think I, to the extent that there's as much learning in the next phase as there was in the last one, that's, that's a good thing. But it's, it's sort of new territory in a way. <laughs> I mean, of trying to figure, out, figure this thing out. I mean, I mean a, a movement hasn't emerged within a political electoral campaign before. I mean, and, and that's kind of what's happening. And, and then there's the whole question of governance itself. And what, what about governing, in what ways of governing can people be engaged and civic capital be created, not just through the campaign mechanism, but I mean, if we're gonna really de deal seriously with environmental challenges, local communities have to be mobilized and organized and engaged in thoughtful ways. Why can't we do that through government too? I mean, government doesn't, uh, well, yes, the whole thing, trained, educated, I mean, uh, leaderships. I mean, there's an enormous possibility, but it's beyond um, it's beyond uh, 
emails from Barack and emails to Barack. I mean, it's much, much beyond that. I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> yeah, I always tell organizers who work for us, you know, it, don't expect this to be the norm, you know, you don't, you don't get, you don't get, you know, this and that and that uh, in resources wise. Um, and, you know, that, that the money and, and the resources that we were able to, to raise, I mean, I think really helped our ability to be able to be everywhere, to get people engaged, um, to have organizers on the ground, you know, more so. But it was also the commitment to, to I mean, we could have spent more money on TV and, and earlier, and we could have spent more money on a lot of other marketing techniques and instead put it in organizers and, and put it in training people and put it in a lot of things that, you know, we could have definitely taken that budget in Ohio and moved it around on a lot of other things. You know, people wanted me to send more mail. They wanted me to do more robocalls, but we put it into organizers. We put it in training. We put it into materials for our volunteer leaders. So um, I don't think I'm getting at your deeper question. Marshall will do that. Um, <laughs> that's my job. That's his job. But, um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, you can't take that away. But you also can't take away the, the, the work that the, um, the new media folks did in terms of creating a narrative and, and using and getting people to come back and getting them to feel like, hey, I'm giving money and it's actually it's being used for something of good. Because I saw the local office in my neighborhood, I can't tell you how much money we raised in kind where people would contribute and they they wanted to contribute to know that there was going to be an office in their community um, and they kept coming back and so there was there was some like okay this money is being used in a way that I can see it I want to give more um, and the way that they were telling the story online was was huge in um, that regard and then when you talk about uh, when you talk about co the competition piece and I'll just talk about that for a second um, I, I don't know because I didn't look at them that, that much I would only go to the I wouldn't go to the McCain website that much except for to see if there were events in, in the area and things like that but I don't I don't know and somebody could tell me in the room if their tools technology were, were any better or worse um, but if you, it was it, it's it's not necessary you know in that competition um, you know the tools are again it's back to the sort of the carpenter and the candidate and the message and things like that um, but you can build great tools in some of those congressional races but if you don't have the right message that, that sort of gets people to go to those groups and gets them to use those tools or you're not talking in a way about getting involved and you know Barack would talk about the website and talk about the groups and talk about these things when he was at um, meetings and it created a narrative where people wanted to go online and do those things so it's not necessarily just the competition um, you want to say answer deeper Last comment. 15 minutes late to their copy. Okay, last comment. It's got to be profound. No. Uh, Saul Alinsky said there's two sources of power, organized people and organized money. Uh, and I think Barack figured out how to do both. And I think it's important to treat the, the financial resources not as some deus ex machina, but also the result of very, very effective uh, organizational work in which the Internet was a central, central piece of, but, not, but, but in a context. And, and I think it's really important to keep appreciating the context in which the tools were used to appreciate the conditions under which they work and what they can do. So, that's it. Good.